All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Tangela. Mm -hmm. and I am. One second, let me make sure everybody's off mute. OK, we're good. All righty. Um, and I am an instructor in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies and one of the members of the inaugural faculty fellowship in the USF Humanities Institute. And I'd like to welcome you all to our final event for this semester, Reimagining Blackness, a roundtable discussion on blackness and black storytelling. And so we won't spend time introducing ourselves today, but I encourage you to check out our first seminar. I put the link in the chat um, that has the link to our web page for our previous events. And that way you can learn a little bit about who we are in our work. And so for today, we just kind of wanted to jump right in. Um, I'm excited about today's roundtable because the idea for it actually kind of stemmed from our previous event, which one of our faithful attendees asked us if we could all just kind of, you know, talk about our thoughts on blackness. And then afterwards, we realized that we needed to do a whole event on it because there wasn't enough time and space to devote to that question. And so here we are. Um, again, I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your day to be here with us. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Let's see. So I'm going to share screen. And then after me, we'll have Professor Ponton and then we'll have Professor Freeman. Okay. Alrighty, so I titled my roundtable talk, Dr. Searle's Meditations on Blackness in Four Parts. And so when I sat down to write my creative offerings on blackness, the first drafts of my poems lacked form and structure. And so I knew that I had to revise them. But when I went to revise them, I wanted to be intentional about making sure that the form the forms of the poems were explicitly linked to a black aesthetic. And so I did research and I found forms of or two poems. So the Kwanzaa, which I have here, and then finish up the my presentation with the Ein two poems that I wrote. And so I encourage you all to do a little bit of research to learn more about these forms. Um, but real briefly, the Kwanzaa is a form of poetry inspired by the seven day holiday Kwanzaa. It's a poem of praise that celebrates African American culture. It has seven lines, seven words per line, and no word can exceed seven letters. And so I haven't titled my Kwanzaa yet, but I'll go ahead and read it. And then afterwards, I'll offer um, a little bit of analysis for it. So, part one, the creative. Um, untitled. What a fortune we've been given from long ago, though at times it seems like a burden to carry. It is our armor, our crown, our joy. Adorn the body with symbols and colors of life. Lift every voice and sing. We can't stop living. We can't stop. And so the first four lines of my poem allude to the color of our skin. Um, as Black folk. And so, and since the Quinsaba poem is a poem of celebration, I wanted to minimize the trials and tribulations that um, are associated with Blackness and instead focus on the pride of um, Blackness by using words such as crown and joy and alluding to the ways that we adorn our bodies. Um, and with the last two lines, I was thinking specifically about the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, of course, and I was also thinking about um, our late colleagues, Dr. Amataya Jaloshul's upcoming book, You Can't Go to War Without Song, and anticipating all the brilliance that I'm sure is going to be in it. Um, and it was interesting to me that even in a poem about praise that I was writing, that I couldn't quite escape the desire to articulate the struggle that is associated with Blackness. And so I decided to just leave it there instead of continuing to struggle with it. I think it's completely about praise because I think that, you know, you kind of have to acknowledge both. So that's my Quinsaba poem. 
So part two for me in my meditations on blackness is the political. And so for my political definition of blackness, I was inspired by black feminists and womanist scholars. And even though black feminism is one of my re research areas, this part of like my meditations um, was the most challenging for me to draft. And I wonder whether it's possible with the, I guess, academic language that I'm used to using, if it's possible to capture the essence of Blackness. And so admittedly, I'm still thinking through my political meditations and definitely um, invite you all to um, kind of give feedback on this section. So I'll go ahead and read these um, political offerings. So Blackness is a political identity. I mean political in the widest sense of the word to mean any situation or relationship of differential power between groups or individuals. And I um, took the definition of political from Gloria Hull and Barbara Smith's introduction to all the women are white, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave, which is like a foundational text in black feminisms. Two, blackness is politically determined to appreciate, that is see value in the many cultures that have been birthed out of the African diaspora for better or worse. Three, blackness is aware that is defined in relation to whiteness. Blackness is intellectually and materially aware of whiteness and its historical relationship to power. Four, blackness is intersectional it's always both and. And five, black blackness usually, but not always, manifests in a melanated person. And so even though this is part two, I actually wrote this part first and um, brought it to our weekly um, cohort meetings for feedback. And we had a lot of discussion, particularly around the fifth one. So I'm, I'm interested to get you all's feedback on my political offerings. Alrighty, so part three, the cultural. So I decided to consider blackness and black storytelling through the lens of black poetry as a way to attempt to capture some of the central traits of blackness that may only be known intuitively and maybe even inconsistently. Um, one of my undergraduate professors taught me that poetry is one of the highest forms of human expression. And since then, I've been intimidated by the art form. Um, but I've always loved and appreciated poetry as a form of storytelling. And so the following are not original offerings, but there are two poems that inspired me to return to poetry as I considered the questions, what is Blackness and what constitutes Black storytelling? And so if you attended our first um, event, you know that I'm a huge lover of Audre Lorde. And so here we have her offerings again, and I'm going to read her poem, A Litany for Survival first, and then I'll read the second poem that kind of inspired me to return to poetry as I considered these questions. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone, for those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going, in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward at once, before and after, Seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths, so their dreams will not reflect the depth of ours. For those of us who were imprinted with fear, like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hope to silence us. For all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. 
When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. And the second poem that inspired me to return to poetry was written by Amanda Gorman. And so Amanda Gorman, who's pictured here, is the youngest inaugural poet in U.S. history. And she released this poem the day Cal Rittenhouse was acquitted. Um, she posted it to her Instagram with the caption, sometimes we have no words and sometimes words are all we have. Wrote these lines months ago, but they felt like they were written for today. Take care of each other. And then she had the black praying hands emoji. Though we strove that we came in peace, he was already at war. We have battled hard to be. Nothing, nothing can keep you safe. Silence, least of all. Look alive, everyone. May such a prayer, a people, a peace, a promise be ours. Be right and radiant and real. And she didn't have a title for her poem, so I think it's untitled, although it might be um, in her upcoming um, poetry collection, which I think is going to be titled Call Us What We Carry, coming out next year. Okay, so part four, the creative again. So when I sat down to write my creative offerings on blackness i wanted to move in this spirit with which i imagined lord and lord and gorman move when approaching their works i hope i did their inspiration justice and so the i'm two poem is a form of african-american poetry that consists of seven lines with a total of 32 syllables or words the lines have a two four six eight six four two structure which indicates the cyclical nature of life and so I didn't title these either. I just put, you know, one, two, and three, although you could probably read them together. And so I'm going to read these offerings for you and then offer a little bit of, I guess, commentary on them and move out of the way for my colleagues. <laughs> okay, so. I want freedom to rise with the moon and set with the sun. I want liberty with them, but it evades me. Rejoice in the struggle. I want to run away to worlds inside myself. I promise to come back for you. Freedom and liberty, we struggle to take them. I am whole, healed, and filled with grace, spirit, and pride. Gratitude and devotion to dark and the light. Shema, ever ready, amen. And so for my I'm Two poems, I really wanted to focus on freedom and struggle for the first, or freedom and liberty and the struggle for those in the first two I and two poems. Um, we know that, you know, technically Black people in the United States have freedom, but we haven't really been able to um, enjoy the liberty of that freedom. And I wanted to call attention to that. Um, I was thinking of a couple of things with this particular one. I was thinking of Harriet Tubman and how she came back um, to guide enslaved Africans to freedoms. But I was also thinking about it like on a more like personal and intimate level in terms of like running away inside of oneself because there's like we're creative and brilliant beings and there are whole worlds inside of ourselves, especially when we think about, you know, blackness and black folk and just really wanted to kind of um, convey that we are way more that meets the eye. Um, and in the last I to, I wanted to kind of hold darkness and light at the same time. I didn't want to just only kind of think about darkness um, without thinking about light, but I also wanted to think about darkness not as kind of like an abomination. I wanted to think about it um, as Cole Ridley would say, as like this notion of holy dark or as a place that um, has the ability to bear the divine. And so 
that with that last one. And so I know that I've spent a lot of time talking about um, blackness and my offerings, and I didn't really go too deep into black storytelling. But what I will say um, before I end my talk is that if I had to sum up black storytelling, I'd say that it's the ability of ones to capture the essence of blackness in a way that contributes to the culture. And I'd also say that black storytelling, whether implicitly or explicitly, frequently comments on the political nature of black life. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Tangela. Um, first, I wanted to thank everyone who is here um, participating today. Uh, there are lots of you, and I see a lot of grad students and undergraduates that I have had the privilege of spending time with over the past several years. So thank you all for showing up today. Um, my approach to this question, uh, what is Blackness, uh, is experimental this time around. Um, I was inspired by in the first week we or the first month that we did the seminar, we read the comet by W.E.B. Du Bois, which was a short story, a fictional account of what the world would look like um, if a catastrophe struck, uh, what would race become in that instance. Uh, I'm also inspired by Afro pessimism's approach to the disciplines, which is pretty anti-disciplinary and critical race theories um, commitment to storytelling as a kind of academic rigor in its own right that should be respected. Um, I am not <laughs> a natural storyteller um, and so this this will be uh, experimental um, but uh, what I've enjoyed about the experimental is that it's allowed me to sort of open up um, my mind to thinking about this question in new ways. Uh, and so this, I'm going to present this story um, and I'm going to offer it up to you without any additional commentary on the tail end. Uh, so hopefully the ways that it opened me up to thinking about this question, it might also open you up to, to thinking about this question, what is blackness in different ways uh, and possibly open us up for, for some conversation as well. So I'm going to turn off my camera because this is a presentation and I want to save a little bandwidth here. Um, and I will just look to make sure I still see Dr. Freeman's on the screen. So you can give me a thumbs up just to make sure that the sound is working once the presentation starts. That would be great. I begrudgingly raise my head from my pillow to the sound of gentle music playing from my cell phone. It sits on a nightstand, vibrating with an option to snooze or to turn the alarm off completely. But it's already 8 o'clock, so I refuse the urge to snooze and say to myself sternly, OK, let's do this. My feet hit the floor. I stand and stretch, letting out a yelp that would disturb a stranger. It's all part of the process, a Friday like any other Friday. I have breakfast, two soy riso and egg tacos with avocado and pico de gallo, naturally. I bathe, throw on clothes I had prepared the previous evening, listen to the news on my smart speaker as I head out the garage. Work is typical. I spend some time reading, some time writing, too much time on emails, not enough time grading, a less enjoyable time doing cardio, an exorbitant amount of time grabbing two handfuls of groceries. I arrive home. I leave my groceries on the floor at the entrance of the kitchen and tilt my head to the side and ask myself, did I leave that there? There, smack in the middle of the island, sits a coffee mug. I'm a tea drinker and usually don't have the time to have tea at home in the morning, so I take it in a mug with a lid. It has an owl with glasses on it, very studious and a little whimsical. Wait, 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 wait. Why am I thinking about the owl mug? Why is this mug on the counter? Did I leave it there? I walk over to it. It's been used. I lift it up and turn it towards one of the kitchen windows where the evening sunlight is filtering through open blinds. There's a thin layer of glaze on the bottom of the mug. The residual sugar is from a sweetened hot beverage that had been consumed. Someone was here. 
I place the mug back down and it smacks the granite harder than I anticipated. I quickly bring my now shaking hand back towards my side. My eyes are darting around looking for nothing in particular, but perhaps a sign that might give meaning to this trace. Someone was here. My breathing is a bit labored now. I don't like this feeling. My heart seems to beat against my sternum in a steady but increasingly fast rhythm. There must be some reasonable explanation, I think. I pull out my cell phone, but there's no indication that anyone has accessed the smart lock to get inside the house. But maybe one of my friends or family members did come by and the app didn't register the entry and exit. Technology had often promised more than it could deliver after all. I call my three closest friends. No, I didn't come by today. Each of them says, but let's go have a drink. That's why these are my closest friends. Maybe later, I answer. I have to figure out who was in my home. I call my family members. They are just getting home themselves from a long day of work. Do you think somebody broke in? They ask, pushing my heart rate back up. I take a deep breath and tell them I'll call back when I learn anything else. Someone was here. And they had left a trace, a trace that now terrified me because it had no answer, no one I could point to, no one I could hold responsible, no one I could keep tabs on, except, yeah, the camera, a motion-sensitive camera hangs on the wall in the adjacent room and can see most of the kitchen. I open the app and scroll back through the day. I see myself eating my breakfast tacos, and sheesh, I need to improve my posture. There is no indication of motion between the time I left and the time I returned, at least none that the camera registered as motion. And still, in the morning frame, the counter is empty. In the evening frame, the lone mug sits. I stand still. There are no sounds except for the gentle hum of the refrigerator. And I've never really minded being alone or being in my own company, really, but now I was actually alone. My sense of security and myself and my home and what I consider to be my domain. It has not just been violated, it's been stripped of its meaning. Who am I? I don't know anymore. Can I ever return to who I was or who I imagined myself to be? I can't even begin to fathom that possibility. I've never been truly alone before. Shit, 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 shit. I whisper as I fall back into my body and begin to feel with intensity the rise and fall of my chest, the shakiness of my palms, the tingling sensation as goosebumps rise on my skin. Someone was here, but what? Before I can finish the thought, I notice a figure standing across the street, staring into my living room window through the open curtains. What the fuck? I walk over to the window. It's hard to make the figure out. I know the rule. If you're in a horror film, don't approach the creepy figure staring at you. Get into your damn car and drive the hell away. Leave the spoils for the maniac with the saw. But this figure, something about it is off. And and this is my home. I leave the front door and cross the street. Approaching the figure doesn't bring it any more into focus than when I had been in the house. That's odd. Here it was, a human form, but entirely nondescript. What color was it? Maybe beige or gray or I don't know Sherman Williams might have lamb's ear or toasted almond but none of these words really work their sex I can't really guess the usual characteristics we use to presume people's genders are just not there shit 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 I whisper in my head now as I get closer hey who are you I ask the person (laughs) I think I'm being forceful but it probably sounds very hesitant The figure seems to look at me, but I also feel them looking through me. I stop moving forward, now only a few feet away. My peripheral vision catches something swaying in the slight breeze from the figure's left hand, and it's a used tea bag. It's still wet. I look down further and to the right, there is a box of rose hibiscus tea, a favorite of mine because it's caffeine free. I look back up at the figure. Did you? Before I can finish, they speak. It's an emotionless cadence. The words come out as a matter of fact. I have the right to be here. And well, they do. I back away, pulling my cell phone from my pocket to take a picture. The figure seems to grin, but perhaps it had always been grinning. The screen blinks, the picture was taken. I go to the photo album. Nothing is there. Well, something is there. The streetscape is there, but it's almost as if the figure is camouflaged. The tea bag still dangles and the box still sits on the asphalt surface, but the figure appears as a 
a distortion, not an image. What the fuck? I whispered to myself again. I call for help. The police arrive, listen to my story, and I show them the motion camera footage. I point out the figure across the street. I note that my box of rose hibiscus tea is missing. I show them the weird photograph. They check the doors and windows for forced entry. I follow them outside to the front of the house. And now we're in earshot of the figure. They ask if I'm sure everything was locked. Yeah, I don't even use the doors when I leave the house, I say, pointing to the garage as my main entry and exit point. Can you just question that person across the street or have them leave? The officers seem uninterested. You can't prove anything was taken and they have the right to stand there. I raise my finger to object, but before I can get a syllable out, the officers nod at each other. There's nothing to see here. The figure's grin seems to widen. They chuckle menacingly, or at least I think they do. I point this out, but the officers seem incapable of seeing or hearing the taunting. In fact, by uttering the words, there's nothing to see here, the figure seems to become completely imperceptible to their senses. I, I, I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm alone. I call my friends and family again. I can't stay here alone. I need their company. I need them to affirm that I'm not mad. I keep my curtains open as I prepare for their arrival and packing the groceries that are now room temperature. When my loved ones arrive, some help me cook, others check and secure all the points of entry in the house. We catch up and laugh and almost forget that there is a figure now covered under the shadow of night still watching us. And as the night grows longer, it seems the figure will never leave. And so the laughter and singing and eating, they begin to fade. And the weight of our histories, individual and collective, become the point of conversation. Is this what it felt like to guard your home against night riders? Is this what our great grandparents felt during Jim Crow? Is this what it was like to have an overseer? The clock nears midnight. Honestly, we thought the end would come sooner. But the police didn't help. The law couldn't help. Our collectivization helped me, but it didn't free me from this gaze. Then we hear a solemn voice. I've seen them before. My aunt says, standing with her arms crossed the living room window. The thing across the street, I ask, wondering how this had not already come up in conversation. Yeah, nephew, but well, it's hard to see them, isn't it? I don't even know where I know them from. I feel like I've seen them everywhere, at work, outside my home, driving, while shopping. During my hip surgery, I thought it was the drugs. I thought I was seeing a ghost, but now I don't know. I feel like they were in my hospital room. I feel like I see them everywhere, but also, I feel like I see them nowhere. Everyone in the room seems to nod. There's a cacophony of voices, each one telling at the same time stories about seeing something that wasn't there or seeing nothing that was definitely there. I walk over to the window. The tea bag still dangles, the box still sits on the ground. The taunting grin is still there, but how can I see it? It's so dark out there. Am I seeing it or am I feeling it? I'm unsure of everything except that I'm not alone. Or perhaps I am alone, perhaps we are all alone, but at least we're alone together. This brings little comfort. I turn to the room, all is silent except for the lively crickets dancing outside the windows. I cherish this moment, but I also despise it. And then I ask to no one and to everyone, are we mad? Are we mad? Are we mad? Are we? Thank you. Uh, that's the end of my story. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to offer any commentary on it, but I'm just going to pass it along to Dr. Freeman next. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. And it's Professor Freeman. Um, but uh, so for my work, I guess uh, I'll, I'll just introduce it by saying that uh, the works that I make are uh, mainly through artwork through visual means in terms of sculpture, animation, paintings, and a lot of different other formats. Um, and I think I've kind of built in a lot of my discussion directly into the presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, talking about what is blackness. Just a second here.
Here we go. What is blackness? I've used the term blackness to describe a central theme of my work for over 20 years, but I've never explicitly tried to define it. So though I have read the works of others that talk about blackness, my use of it is intuitive and does not stem from a singular or generally accepted source. For me, blackness includes a broad range of ideas and perceptions about black people, black skin, history, aesthetics, stereotypes, and ideals. The key word here is perception. So I'm primarily concerned with how black people are seen from both internal and external vantage points. It is a whole interconnected body of ideas that are inclusive of both pro-black and anti-black ideas. They're not necessarily about truth or authenticity. Blackness is seen as scary, ugly, lazy, and ignorant, while it is simultaneously seen as comforting, beautiful, rich, creative, strong, and hardworking. Blackness is what we associate with blackness, or be better yet, it is what is associated with blackness. As such, blackness is not static, uniform, or autonomous, and it is necessarily wrapped up with preconceived stereotypes, ideals, and values that have formed from oppression, resistance, and celebration. I love being black, I love dark skin, I love our hair, I love our comedy, our ways of speaking, dance, creativity, vernacular, rhythms, voices, and this can go on. And others love it too. Some admire it from a distance, others try to imitate it, and some steal from it to make it their own. But I don't like all of it. Certain aspects of blackness resonate with me and other parts don't. I recognize that my blackness can reach a room before I do and can engulf me um, when I am present and stay long after I have departed. I understand that I can be too black and not black enough. It is the thing that we try to be, and it is also the thing that we try to conceal or avoid, because we live in a world where anti-blackness is structural and is woven into our social interactions, our laws, our finances, our jobs, and our challenge to survive. In the same way that some have been conditioned to hate blackness, like many, I've been conditioned to love it. Blackness is not black people. Blackness is an idea or multiple ideas that are projected onto the lives and bodies of black people. It is an entity all to itself. Henry Osawa Tanner, who was described as the first internationally acclaimed African-American artist, described race as a ghetto of isolation and neglect. And he believed that artists would gain recognition only after they escaped from it. He was talking about race in general. He, uh, he wasn't talking about race in general. He was talking about blackness. As he consciously removed affirming images of black people and overt political content from his paintings, he focused more on biblical paintings and moved to France to escape the brand of racism that was in the States. These were Tanner's conscious choices to survive and gain recognition as an artist. He was trying to escape blackness, not being black. My early paintings used black and brown goo as an, in, as an embodiment of blackness. It was a living entity. It could cover the body and it could be consumed. It could take many forms and was always present in some way. My later sculptural works have direct, con direct co connections with that goo. Uh, the shiny all black bulbous organic forms allude to the same abject goo today. The sculptures represent transfigured black bodies that are simultaneously beautiful, grotesque, sensual, and humorous. They are essentially about the curious mutations, hybridity, and strange figurations of blackness. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. There's a level of pride in blackness. We've had to create our own light when others have said that we have none. And out of that, there's a duality in loving our blackness and the fear of blackness. It is not far from the double consciousness that W.E.B. Du Bois described as the experience of always looking at oneself through the eyes of a, way, of a racist white society and measuring oneself by the means of a nation that looked back in contempt. I remember my white high school chorus teacher asking us all in rehearsal, why do you have to sing so black? Our voices influenced by the black church, full of gospel, blues, jazz, and R&B were too black. When I listen to my favorite singers now, I listen for the funk. I want the notes and chords that trigger the face that we do. For me, that is blackness. I can relate. Black people are connected through blackness. Brown skin, brown skin. You know I love your brown skin. I don't know where yours begins and I don't know where mine ends. While the edge of blackness, the edges of blackness are potentially always defined by whiteness, I resist the idea that blackness is only about the oppression or the absence of life. I also res resist the idea of crediting whiteness with the life or beauty that blackness creates. 
Blackness is both joy and tears. It is a substance that connects us, and it is many things. Blackness is D'Angelo with no shirt, the pick with the fist, Jill Scott, y'all, James Brown, Mike Brown. It is Richard Pryor in his peak. It is shea butter and cocoa butter. It is the moment we first saw Amanda Gorman walk to the podium. And it is Angela Bassett anytime. I can go on. In Jordan Peele's Get Out, the main character was displaced and the Black people were unfamiliar. He could not relate to them. Something was off and it was not their skin. Instead, it was white people and Black bodies. He was isolated in a white world. And that brings us back to Black storytelling. What is Black storytelling? Black storytelling is about Black worlds. I don't want a world without Blackness, and it's not necessary for everyone to be Black. But for Black storytelling, some type of Black world has to be created for the characters. A Black world for me is not a world where Blackness does not matter. It is a world where Blackness is a part of the story and is recognizable. It is a place where the substance that resonates still exists. And it continues to teach us about humanity. It expands our notions of what blackness is and what it can be. It is not a narrative reduced only to struggle and despair or poverty, but also of love, fear, awkwardness, and every other human emotion and condition. They should be images and narratives expressed through the lens and influence of blackness, ideally through black people. Black storytelling can be slippery because any definitive rules can probably be broken. I also recognize that my understanding of blackness is of blackness in the US. So apart from the substance being integral in the story, I wrestle with these questions when talking about black storytelling. Intended audience, who is the author? What systems play a role in producing and distributing the work? How are black bodies portrayed and who is portraying them? Is it inclusive of Black voices, Black bodies, and Black ideas? What stereotypes does it reinforce and which ones does it challenge? Do I see myself and do I see my Black self? The end. All right, so thank, let me see it. So I want to thank you all. Um, and uh, do, Tangela, do you want to take next part or do we want to open up for questions? Sure, I was typing that I love those questions that you posed at the end of your presentation. I don't think that I remembered them when we were doing our um, rehearsal, so yeah. Um, so yeah, we can um, open it up to our attendees for comments or questions or talk back up. I like to call it. Yep, Jordan. I have questions, comments, and and just wonderful things to say about everyone. Thank you so much for sharing all of y'all for sharing. You know this beautiful, beautiful work. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'll start with you, Dr. Searles, because because you were first. I mean, there's a lot I, I might disagree with, but but one of the things I, I wanted you to elaborate on very specifically is you were talking about, you framed it as a meditation, right? And it got me thinking about Descartes, and I don't know if that, if that relation was intentional, but the, the basic relation of it is, I think, something akin to selfhood, right? That there is some way that as Black people or as Black folk, we can internalize, we already have internalized our conception of Blackness. And it is it is more a work of internal investigation than it is of external investigation. Um, but where I, I hesitate with that conception is in the way that you are you articulated as being melanated, which seems to harken back to Fanon's idea of being epidermalized. And I don't know if I can vibe with that <laughs> personally, but I, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about what it means to think oneself as black, what that kind of relation is, because you also say that it's it's melanated, but not always melanated, right? right? That there are different kinds of blackness that can find itself in the individual. So I wanted to, to ask you that first, but I have questions for everybody else, so don't 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 cut me off yet. <laughs> so I'm and I'm glad you asked that question. And I think it's so interesting because 
Professor Freeman asked a similar question when we were doing our dress rehearsal. And as a loyal attendee, Jordan, you know, we've been thinking about this the entire time. So for me, and this is what I told Professor Freeman when we were talking about it. And so that's the reason why I put like the not always, because there are some people whose skin looks like they're black people, but they would not themselves identify as being black. And so I wanted to define blackness in a way that for folk who either look like they are a part of what we would consider black, a black identity could easily identify themselves as such or not. So this way that they could kind of opt in or opt out of it. I feel like, and that's part of the reason I think that I struggle with defining blackness from a political perspective and was glad to be able to go to the creative because for me, it's like, so I don't want to tell someone's story who was shared to us, but there was uh, a story about a woman who we would consider black, who was afraid of other black people because of like the horror stories that they had heard about or she had heard about them um but her ancestors weren't enslaved in the united states i think um she was from the caribbean and so she didn't necessarily identify as being black but if she were to walk out on the street somebody would call her black you know what i mean and so for me it's like i wanted i, I don't want i don't want to ignore the fact that what we look like, like what our skin tone is, is associated with blackness. Like, I, I don't think that, I don't wanna just kind of gloss over it. And regardless of how it's you know, articulated or not, I think that in the messiness of trying to frame it or to talk about it, it is worth thinking about because there are people who like I said, who look like for all intents and purposes, like they are black people, they're clearly their ancestors were from the continent of Africa, but they might not necessarily get with, you know, black or understand it. So I don't, I don't know. I struggle with that part. Um, I'm glad that you offer pushback for it because it does make me think about, okay, now how do I continue to think? Cause I don't, I don't like want to delete it just because people push back against it because like, no, that just means I have to figure out how to continue to refine it because there has to be something, something to be said or a representation at least, or a way for people who don't intellectualize blackness to still be able to enter into it. So for me to go to, you know, my friends or cousins who are not in the academy, who don't, who aren't, you know, properly educated, but would still consider themselves be black by sheer virtue of what they look like a way to bring them into the fold and into the discussion of blackness too so that's kind of what i was trying to get at and that's part of the reason why i put not always because i do recognize that some people you know just don't want to identify as black regardless of how they look and would rather identify as you know their ethnicity or you know like maybe their country of origin as opposed to Blackness. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that was kind of like the thinking behind why I, I phrased it the way that I did. No, that's perfect. And that, that moves directly into the question I had for Dr. Freeman, because it seems that something that you're trying to articulate is blackness as an identity, or I feel as Dr. Freeman has been reading his Fred Moten, <laughs> and it's more akin to articulating blackness as a kind of aesthetic gesture in the world, a kind of relational structure, which is very similar to like something like Lissant says. So in, in reference to Dr. Freeman's work, my question was, well, I first wanted to say that I love the way in one of your images that you try to recontextualize and recoup um, the minstrel. That was some, that was one of the concerns I had throughout the program, because it's like, that's a whole domain of history that we don't have any real foot in, that we have to mediate in certain new and, and interesting ways. And I think the way you navigate that through your paintings is amazing. And I love the way that you have that kind of Pinocchio image and this idea that this relation to Disneyfication and blackness is a worrying relation and one that we must always consider. And if we are going to perform aesthetic projects is something that always has to be in the back of our minds. Um, I, I, as, as a side note, I wanted to just mention Tanner and, and mention another artist, Gene Toomer, who wrote Cain, who also had that try to escape from blackness. And I don't know if Tanner's really doing that. 
Uh, I think it's more race in general because I think what he's trying to get at is something that I think Dr. Charles is trying to, 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 to try to know is this is this spirituality, is this black spirituality, right? I think while you don't have this, and I mean, you can get on him for depicting a white, you know, white Christ and that's all fine and dandy, but I think what he's trying to carry when he does leave America is that blackness is greater than the skin. And it's the same thing that Gene Toomer is trying to do when he leaves after Kane, is that Blackness doesn't have to be predicated on this relationship to the skin. It can be predicated on the spiritual relation. Um, so the question I have for you is that in this way that you seem to be following Moton's conception of blackness being more of an aesthetic gesture, how do you deal with all those things that aren't aesthetic? How do you deal with blackness as ugliness, as objection? You know, thinking to someone like Arthur Jaffa's work and the way in which he uses the slave's body as, as abject or someone like... Frida Okala, who uses the black body as something object. How do you begin to think of those works and, and how does that work? You know, how, how do you try to think through objection in your own work? And I'll put those books in, in the chat. <laughs> you're muted, you're muted, you're muted, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's a few things. I guess first about Tanner. Um, in in many ways, and I think especially when he talked about his work and and how he tried to respond to others, he embraced his he embraced his his him him being black. I'll put it that way. I was gonna say I see he embraced his blackness, but I'm gonna say he embraced his he embraced his black blood. Let's put it that way. Um, he was very light. Um, he could almost pass in some ways, um, but but I think that he was trying to escape blackness. Um, in the sense that his work was always framed um, by others in the con in the context of being a Negro artist or being um, uh, that it was it was other than because he was was black and I think he wanted to be seen on the same footing um, as as several other artists and not necessarily um, uh, seen of, of of as a lower status or special I guess is another thing from that um, the I, I do not, I mean, uh, there are a lot of, a lot of parts of my works are about objection, right? And, and distortion of the body. It's about, it's about beauty and about ugliness, but I don't see that as being um, different from aesthetics. So, so in the sense that like aesthetics don't, like there's some, there, if I were to describe something as beautiful, right? Like I can use that word. Beautiful just means there's just like the positive, Right. But um, but when I talk about aesthetics, I'm talking about a whole range of things that in include um, how you manipulate beauty, um, which includes ugliness. Like there's a full range there. So um, so I guess when you ask me that question, I, I would say it's inclusive of all of it, all of that. And um, because I think when I also think about aesthetics, I'm I'm thinking about a way that you you can use relationships to create. Um, uh, uh, emotional, physical, visual responses um, to something, and and uh, the things that are not beautiful uh, can be very intentional. Even in even in song, like it's like that's a dirty chord. It's not a pretty sound, um, but it but it but it's there and it has a purpose. It's structural. It has an intention to to sort of evoke something. And that, and that, so when I talk about, when I think of aesthetics, that's what I think about. So, so the other people that you were talking about fit into that. And, and then I always, so would say that's a part of my work. No, perfect. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that perfectly leads into what I had to say to Dr. Ponton. But um, I, I, just to comment on that real quick, I mean, I, I guess for me in thinking about, not, not that I'm harking to Kant. But that Kant would disagree, right? That Kant would say that that ugliness is not is not an aesthetic encounter. That is something to be abhorred and objected and not to be affirmed. So what you're kind of articulating, it seems to me, is that aesthetics, that blackness as a kind of aesthetic gesture is one which recontextualizes aesthetics plainly, which I can affirm and I can accept that. But it's I think that if that is the case, then that means our task is one which has to refuse and destroy European conceptions of beauty. Um, but that moves perfectly to Ponson's, I think, uh, you know, work. And I don't want to analyze it because I think it's best left in this way that is vague and, and that is subtle. Um, but it's more just a, a very personal question of it seemed to me that Kafka 
or, or, or Nathaniel Mackey seem to be a background influence. Is I, am I right in that or am I off base? I just wanted to ask that. I didn't want to do any analysis. I think that'd be improper here. But it seemed to me that you had some Kafka, some analysis of the bureaucratic, some Nathaniel Mackey or, or, some, or some other contemporary Black poet who's influencing some of what you had to say. And I was just curious if, if, if I was on base or if I was wrong. Uh, oh, are you asking? Are you asking? Uh, yes. Paul Paul or, yeah, okay. um, yeah I, you're not off base. And I, it does lead from your conversation with, with Dr. Freeman. First, I just want to say I feel so we, we set up this roundtable discussion and usually a roundtable discussion has like a discussant who who takes care of each of the presenters. And I feel like Jordan has become our unofficial discussant. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so so you're not off base there, and I and I think you are right that it it fits in very well with the conversation that you just had with Dr. Freeman, um, because why sh why should Kant get the last word on what aesthetic means, and as, especially given right Kant is he's in, working in the 18th century where where anti-blackness is right, it's being birthed in this very. Um, in a very scientific and theological way, and he is informed by all of that in his work. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I, I think that right the task of black storytelling, at least as it's been done here today amongst the three of us, as, and as you all have mentioned in three very different ways, with three very different perspectives, um, I think what what holds it all together is an attempt to to unsettle and undo the presumptions, especially as they concern what it means to um, to consider a thing beautiful, um, or to define what it means to have an aesthetic, but also uh, but also what it means to have your conception of self already imposed upon. So right when when Dr. Searles writes her poetry, she's unable to 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 not say something about struggle because to not say it would be to be dishonest. When when Dr. Freeman presents his artwork, he can't just sit in the beauty of blackness as much as he wants to affirm it, as much as he does with his words, right? There's, there's still a need to contest the meaning that has been ascribed to blackness and that is imposed on black people, uh, which, is, which allows him also dif to differentiate between blackness and black people, such that right, black people can be completely and wholly beautiful but blackness can be much more complicated. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right to, to catch on to that. We're all engaged in this effort of trying to undo the presumptions. Thanks, Jordan. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say thanks, Jordan, and ask Dr. Horace Freeman for her comment or question. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm so excited to see this panel. Jordan, always great to see you. Uh, I have a question for Professor Freeman. And the question, it actually really deals on what Dr. Ponton was saying, which is about representation. And it, this is something that I've followed as you've produced your work over time and kind of watched it shift. One of the challenges is what Black folks want to see and how we want to see ourselves. And, you know, you, Jordan mentioned how we appreciated you doing the menstrual work, that the Black faith. And I'd like you to talk to the audience about the broader reception of that, because you have black folks who we're, we're just wanting to see ourselves not be, not look like monsters, not be hideous, not be, you know, so you, you, you actually kind of struggle with that. And you've, you've had your own personal experiences with people kind of wanting that. I'd like you to talk about how you've responded to that and why you see the intervention of your work still being really important, even if it's not showing the kind of images that, people in your family, people in my family kind of want to see and hang on our walls. Yeah, uh, that's a big question and in a lot of ways. Um, so, I, so I kind of have to figure out where to start and which parts to pick at. So the, um, I think that, uh, so, for for a lot of European art, there's been um, there's been representation of white people for I mean in showing uh, very traditional in, in a in a very developed sense of um, portraiture and um, and and beauty and uh, and represent positive and affirming images that are have existed for a long time um, and in many ways uh, I. In many ways, uh, that 
stream of art has kind of moved on, right? Um, but then it also has been uh, exclusive of black images in that way or black people in that way without actually being able to show that. So then what ha I think one of the things that happens is that that as as we um, create work now and we're inserted into those spaces, um, you have both black people and black artists that want to see affirming images. They want to see portraiture and and um, and and this is a little bit of this is changing, but I think one of the things is like, oh, that's so yesterday. You can't make that. It has to be. I, I think there's an idea, and there are many different ways to make artwork. Maybe it has to be critical. It maybe showing um, showing uh, images of of or portraiture. That's so yesterday, right? There's so so much that's there, right? Um, but but I think it is important for us to have that as well, right? We want to see ourselves. We want to see ourselves um, presented in ways where we are beautiful and we are, and that are affirming, um, and that sort of record our lives, right? Which is another part of that, and show and and actually even a level of realism, which has also kind of been moved on from in some ways. Uh, so and so I think for 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 black people we want to see that, but I think for black artists it's also t um, we want to make that. But then we also have artists that want to participate um, and di have dialogue with a lot of the current work that's going on. So that becomes very sort of a very complicated um, thing for um, for me. Um, and I guess there's more to say there, but for me, I think one of the ways that I have um, dealt with that is I've created different types of work, right? So there's a body of work that is, is um, there's a body of work that's critical and there's a body of work that's kind of explicit, uh, well, I said political and, and maybe more sort of explicitly about um, the, I won't, I will say it this way, but like the ugliness of blackness in, in some ways, but, or more importantly, um, it's about whiteness, um, but, um, or, or the conditions that uh, whiteness have, have created for blackness. Um, but then I also am creating works that, that are affirming that kind of explore, um, explore our faces and are affirming. There's a whole range that's there. Um, but it's also, I think at the same time, that's also one of the things that's made me back up from making certain types of works too. And I think that kind of happens a lot of ways. We were just meeting with someone today, I think, who it's sometimes it's a, it can be difficult to, to always be making work that's about the struggle because we are complex and we have many different sides. And I think that is the important part. We have to kind of, we need to actually be able to represent all of those parts, um, and that and that is that. Yeah, I'll I'll stop there because because I know we're getting close to the end. <laughs> uh, I see Jordan's hand is up. <laughs> uh, just to ask, I guess, one final class question to the panelists. Um, I, I mean, we've talked about this um, through all these discussions, and I'm just curious uh, if I can get your, your, your all y'all final thoughts. Is um, it, it seems to me that part of the project that we're trying to to inaugurate here is something which recharacterizes blackness as a political vo force and voice for positive change, right? It's something that Blackness stands as a kind of grounds to which we can perform this project to finally escape from the bounds of whiteness, or that Blackness is not, in it, while it is conditioned by whiteness, it is not dependent on it, on this relation, it's not a necessary relation, it's something which can blossom or bloom out of it. Um, but I'm deeply concerned by that project because it seems to me that Blackness um, is completely... Uh, contingent with whiteness and with the kind of struggle and suffering that we're trying to escape from. Uh, it seems to me that if we ever do escape, we will lose blackness. Uh, we will have ourselves, we will have us, and we will have everything we need. Um, but it seems to me that something essential, existential about blackness, I think the very idea of, of thinking of blackness as a, a kind of existential or essential formulation will be the thing we lose. Um, so for me, and in the work I try to mobilize, it's about being okay with losing blackness. It's being okay that once we are free, once we're in the break, as Milton puts it, we're gonna lose blackness. We'll still have us, but we won't have this. 
And I was just curious if you think the project moving forward is to reconstruct blackness, if it is to keep it, or if it is to, in our destruction of whiteness, to lose it. Um, but yeah, I just want all of your thoughts. Um, so I, I can start, um, but I'm also curious to hear what other folks in the room have to say about this as well. And I think we're scheduled until 2.30 if I'm right, Tangela. So um, so we do have time for, for folks to ask more questions and to join in. Um, my, uh, so so I am I am not invested in a project of preserving blackness. Um, I and I, I as I, I hope has been clear, but probably I haven't said explicitly before, um, I'm not very concerned with whiteness. <laughs> um, I, I don't see whiteness as uh, as being the thing that that makes blackness coherent or or that inaugurates blackness in the world. I think. Right, the specter, and from from my perspective, is anti-blackness, which I think is distinct from whiteness. I think whiteness is a is a product of anti-blackness, just as blackness is. Um, so, so the elimination of anti-blackness is is foundationally important to me. Um, and if that means at the end the result is we lose this thing that we call blackness, which we've defined in a multitude of ways at this point we've defined it politically and i think that is one of the things we want to get rid of the political imposition that we call blackness uh at the same time i know that there is there, there is a, a strong desire to to conserve um and and you can see it in the chat right to conserve the cultural elements that are associated with it and when when dr freeman put up um put up the picture of the stank face it was just like this immediate sort of oh yeah i know that face yeah i love being black like that kind of people i think want to hold on to that because right it's, it's the thing that you feel it's your heart is what dr searles might call as a part of the erotic um and i'm now i'm just throwing out academic terms but <laughs> um but that being said, I think what we've learned from a lot of the critical theory that we've read um, in terms of not just black optimism, but also Afro pessimism and critical race theory and Fanonian thought uh, and, and thinking about, you know, spillers and winter as well. What we can't know is what the outcome is going to be. The moment that we assume that we know what the end game is, we've already announced its own destruction. All I know is that I want the end of anti-blackness. What the world might look like as a consequence of that, I can't know and I don't want to try to articulate. Uh, because if I do try to articulate, then I put that future at risk. Um, and precisely because articulating it requires me to draw on the languages, the epistemologies, the methodologies that are currently predominant and hegemonic in this world, and those things, as we know, are inherently anti-Black. So to call forth a future would require me to use a language that would necessarily be anti-Black and therefore right, perpetuate anti-Blackness into that future. Can, can I just add something to that since you opened the floor for the, the audience to kind of come in and that, you know, th that's always my favorite part of the conversation, right, is getting folks uh, who were writing in the text. I see you, Victor and Crystal. I'd love for you to join this, this conversation. To say, what I really, what I, I want to go back to this question, and Jordan, you and I have had this conversation uh, before. I am not, I, I think I'm sometimes troubled by the way that when we talk about whiteness and blackness, it's almost as though blackness is conceived of as a static. You either, either, either have it or you don't. Somehow whiteness just get, just exists, and then the blackness is the thing that can leave or go. And I think that part of your response, David, allows us to think about these, think about this in transformation and trans as a as a process and, and as dynamic. And we, like you were saying, we don't know what this is going to become, but what we do know is that everything changes. Whiteness isn't even what it used to be, right? We can we have historical moments when whiteness is reconceptualized, much like blackness. So um, I, I like I like the, the refocus that David, that David poses on anti-blackness, but at the same time, I think that we need to consistently be interrogating the assumptions that we have about this um, what seems to be a totalitarian and, and completely hegemonic whiteness, which I don't believe. And I, I think our survival kind of hinges on us not believing that. Like part of the conversation is about believing that there are point, just there, there are points of, of rupture and disjuncture that give us space to create the world that we're saying we want to have. So 
I just wanted to add that. Love this conversation. So fascinating. I love it too. And I don't have much to add aside from what Professor Ponson has said, because I think he said it just brilliantly. But one of the things that I'm really, and I'm not necessarily tied to it either, but for me, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to make sure that I gave the political definition of blackness, because I don't think that you can talk about blackness without the struggle. And I don't want to always be buried in the struggle of talking about blackness. But I think that, and it goes back to Jordan, I think your original question about, you know, what will blackness look like outside of the struggle? You know what I mean? And so, and it also reminded me of going back to um, Professor Freeman's presentation about Tanner. I'm fascinated about Tanner's work, but I don't know if I would have, if Tanner, decided to leave because he wanted to escape the struggle that was associated with blackness and like the oppression that's associated with blackness. I wonder if I would have put him in that category of people who like are not, who might have melanin or not, but not necessarily see themselves as black, you know? Cause I don't know that I think that people and this is definitely going to be slippery, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't know that I think that folk who are black can not be aware in the best case scenario want to fight against the oppression and the struggles that we face. Like, I don't think that black people have the option to just kind of be oblivious to that. And that's kind of for me where it's tension because it's like, it's a struggle to be black. And if you are a black person and you have this identity, but you, I don't know, I guess that's just a, a level of freedom and liberty that I haven't seen, you know, model, but I don't know what that looks like. So I guess that goes back to your original question too. Um, but we have other hands up. So I will defer to our, I think we had, Crystal, yeah, let's hear from you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having this conversation. Uh, I just wanted to add first, I was privileged to speak with Dr. Freeman as well as Professor Freeman uh, earlier today, but I, I feel like some of re that reimagining will involve um, this complexity across not only in the US, but in the Caribbean and across um, you know, Africa and everyone else around the world that considers themselves black. And and I think w what you just mentioned, Tangela, about um, this um, not having to think about blackness in countries that are predominantly black, that's not even something that is always in, in the thought. Because, for instance, my partner is from, is from Africa and the idea of blackness in America, he had to learn and how moving in spaces that others see you as black and you just know that you are of this color, but you more think of yourself in ethnic groups in where you're from, it's, it's different. And myself coming from Jamaica, I had to also learn how black is in America. I mean, it, you have colorism in the Caribbean and in Jamaica specifically, but it, it, it shows itself a bit differently as it is in America. And so I think some of that reimagining is about really putting forward these complexities in how we are individually in our, in our homes, in our workspaces, in, like in ev everywhere, just all these intersecting complexities. I think, I think that's what will possibly could get us to um, that um, space of, creating these, you know, new ways of expressing ourselves. Well, if I can add to that, I, I think that what Crystal, you, you said what I would have said, like I always bring in Latin America and the Caribbean here. When we talk about the body politics of blackness, I, I think that, that there's something important to be said about number one, what being read as phenotypically black means for your lived experiences. It's not the same as somebody who is passing, but still identifies as black, you absolutely can. But my day-to-day -day life is different. And it's also that the phenotypic part, although blackness is not only limited to phenotype, that, that question, we see this even more when we travel to other places. So let me, let me give you an example in Brazil, for example, where you say, you, 
Kinsley, you were saying, I cannot imagine. You can't be black without kind of having some sense of understanding of the struggle. Yeah, you can. You, you sure can, especially if you've been socialized to believe that blackness isn't real, right? Or you've been socialized to believe that the issues that you're facing are related to class, or you are in a structure where um, all of the markers that for us, all the markers and the conversations and even the discourse that we created to talk about blackness doesn't exist. And I think that if we're able to meet people where they are and have these transnational dialogues, um, I think that there's a lot of power there, but it does require us to think differently about blackness, how it shows up, how anti-blackness shows up differently, but can still be connected, as David was saying, to these fundamental threads of where, this, where these ideas came from. Thank you for that, Dr. Horace Freeman. And for me, that's part of the reason why, and I think I've said this in like conversations with the, the um, humanities cohort, it's part of the reason why if I had to narrow blackness down to talk really specifically, I would first and foremost start with folk whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States, because I think that our experience to blackness and particularly the struggle of Blackness is a little bit different than folks whose ancestors were enslaved in other places or predominantly black places or folks whose ancestors weren't enslaved, period. And I think when I talk about the struggle of blackness, I think about those folk particularly because, I, like you mentioned, like folks whose ancestors were enslaved in predominantly black places don't have that same type of, I guess, relationship to the struggle of their color of their skin their relationship to the struggles might be because of other identities that they hold so but that goes back to what you were saying in terms of the importance of having the transnational conversations because it's not just you know blackness is both and so it's blackness and our class or blackness and our gender or blackness and our sexuality and you know like it's definitely intersectional which goes back to what crystal was saying so i love everything about this conversation well, okay, let me let me just add this. I'm not even suggesting that we see this. I, I think that when I'm in Latin America and different countries, people are building on the conversations that we're having in the U.S. They're not they're not seeing this as totally separate. They've actually been able to leverage some of the same language and discourse to advocate for themselves. And what I think is important is how do you do that without erasing the specificity? So it's it's it's, it's, it's if we can get to the point where we can build on those points of convergence without assuming that it's all the same, but then understand how the Brazilian iteration, the Jamaican iteration, the Colombian iteration um, kind of is layered on that. That's when we get somewhere because people then feel like they don't have to, to forget those ethnic differences in order to mobilize around this sense of kind of this global blackness. So that, that's the future that I'm trying to get to. I, and I feel like I, I'm looking forward to that, to building on that. Um, I'm, in, I'm enjoying this conversation. It is also, emblematic of why I tend to avoid speaking of blackness in terms of identity um, because it's so fraught, right? We have multiple historical contexts at play and multiple contemporary contexts at play. And as you mentioned, transnational conversations that converge but that aren't necessarily completely overlapping. Um, so for for so this this semester, my graduate students, we, we read um, a piece, I think it's race as a Racial Prejudice as a Sense of Group Position by a, a bygone sociologist, Herbert Bloomer. And, uh, and, and the idea that he has there is, like, regardless of your particular identity, regardless of your particular station in society, uh, which can be complex and intersectional and multidimensional and all those things, uh, and he's writing within a U.S. context, but I think it's probably true uh, at the level of, a, at, at the, of the, the modern world context. Uh, we all have a sense of the group position um, that every group that our society considers to be important holds. So it's not so much that a person needs to identify as black or even recognize blackness as a real thing to not to not at the same time also understand that folks who look a certain way belong in a certain place within the given social structure. And whether or not they even agree with that with that sense of where that group is positioned, um, they are aware, and we are all aware, generally, of how other folks in our society generally view entire groups. So, for example, we are all aware that, generally speaking, um, there are privileges for white folks 
around the world that don't apply to people of darker skin tones. Uh, we are also aware like there are certain languages that are more privileged around the world than other languages. Like we all have a sense of how the world is organized hierarchically and it has everything to do with the context of, of racial slavery and colonialism. How we identify personally within our, our particular cultural context doesn't seem to infringe upon that that hegemonic thing that is happening in our head. And and I think that for me, that is what's, that's what's important because then blackness, as Dr. Freeman points out, is not really about the people that we call black, but rather about the social structure that creates the people that we call black. So that's my contribution to this, <laughs> this particular discussion. Yeah, Jordan. No, yeah, this this conversation is fascinating because it reminds me of something that Wilderson talks about and we're trying to destroy the world that I think is problematic there and I think might have a problematic undertone even here. But one of the things he says there in a kind of male chauvinist move is he says that the language of, of international blackness has to be found in America, that he doesn't think any other relation, especially happening in the Caribbean or in Africa, can be the can be the starting point for any true discussion about uh, blackness. He thinks it has to start in, in America first, and someone like Arthur Jaffa agrees with him in that in that sense, as he thinks that um, people who come to America, who you know, who who are of African descent, have to relearn being African, have to relearn what it means to be black. But people who are born in America understand it from a very young age. One of the things Wilderson points out is like it wasn't until Fanon was eighteen that he realized that he was at a distance from the world, right? It wasn't until he was eighteen that he he had this look a Negro moment and that he realized he wasn't a part of the world that he thought he was always a part of. And so that's why you know that's why Wilderson thinks it's so important that that this language starts. To occur in America. But for me, I don't think that's true at all. <laughs> I think there's so much happening that's so interesting in the Caribbean and the way that Glissant articulates it, that that kind of chauvinism is so off the wall and bad and not to be affirmed. But I do think, however, <laughs> but I do think that it is important that we articulate a sort of common held language, because I think what Wilderson is getting at is that despite the fact that it might be perceived as a kind of male chauvinist move, is that, yeah, everybody has their own language of the way we're trying to you know, describe ourselves, trying to either escape, destroy, reconstruct, abolish, etc. If we all come to it with our own terms, then we're going to be infighting like the communists, which is who he's trying to avoid. He's, he's trying to like, he specifically says that Marxism does not have the language to describe the kind of struggle of black, ab of, of black liberation. Because we are trying to avoid that. We're trying to avoid being infighting Trotskyists and Mar Marxists and, and Stalinists. You know, mo we will have like Motinists here and Wildersonists here, right? We're trying to avoid that whole conception. Um, but I'm curious because, you know, this is a room of academics and I'm just a lowly undergrad. Uh, what it, what you guys think it means to construct the language and what it means to share language in terms? Because, I mean, at least for me personally as a semi-Afro-pessimist, I'm trying to move away from the term, but I keep a lot of what Pronson was talking about of this sort of anti-disciplinary, you know, this anti-disciplinary project. Um, and so in, insofar that I'm trying to be anti-disciplinary, the words and use of, of, of academic terms seems completely useless. It seems to me that we have to affirm the terms of Ebonics, of African-American vernacular English. That seems to be the, what we have to turn to. At least that's what I'm trying to turn to in my work. So I'm just curious. I know we only have like nine minutes left, but curious for some thoughts on, on that position. Crystal. I'm, try, I'm trying to be quiet, so I'm going <laughs> to. Crystal has her hand raised. Yes. Hi, I'm back again. <laughs> I I wanted to share that. I love how you shared, Jordan, that um, using Ebonics as a way of describing or creating vocabulary um, to describe this experience. Uh, for me, I've been looking at Patwa, Jamaican Patwa terms, as a way of um, expressing this 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 constructed identity on survival and um and also visual vocabulary by looking back to historically where it said some of some of Jamaicans are coming from so looking at adinkra symbols and as this 
this um, tool that was used for inter like ethnic exchange across various tribes as a vocabulary to visually describe um, experiences and 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 use as a and using economically this deconstructed to have conversations that is bridging the contemporary with the historical and um so for me i'm a visual artist very much like um, professor freeman i think those tactics of reimagining and thinking about uh, you know anti um you know these supremacist views and so forth is by bringing in some of these aspects that uh in in all these various spaces in are in the Caribbean, in in America, in Africa, we have these words that are universal communication that we currently have going. Like Jamaican culture is constantly being exported, so I can pull from that to build these um, these bridges to communicate things. Well, and if, my, if I might add something, you, you asked this question, Jordan, about com a common language. What I want to say is that I, I don't think the goal should be a common language and that that kind of limits us to this very i think european view of kind of the monotheism like there needs to be only one and i'd like us to think about the, the multiple languages and the potential that that brings and thinking about language in terms of words in terms of body and movement me in particular i work on the area of kind of the affective terrain like how are the emotions part of this language that we have and how those emotions play out in our facial expression so there's a whole kind of um, a whole array of, of languages, plural, that I think is, is part of the potential here. So certainly there are these words that are translated in the same, and they mean the exact same thing in other places, and that's great. But I think that it's through embracing that, the plural, the plurality of things, not being threatened by it, engaging and learning these other languages as well, I think it, it's part of the, part of the struggle. I just want to say I love that suggestion. For thinking. If, yeah. if I may respond to it then, just real quick. I know we only have five minutes, but but yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with that position. Yeah, I mean, thinking through the polarity of, you know, Edward Lissant is really important to me. One of the things he says in Refusal of Derrida, it's like, yeah, your work is too Eurocentric. You're only, ca you're only trying to capture the one, the singular. And I totally agree that, yeah, we should try to go beyond the, the one and the singular and try to move into the plural. I guess my worry is, I mean, is, is that we're not all saying the same thing. It's kind of Tower of Babel. You know, we're all saying blackness, but we all mean something different when we say blackness. And it's like, well, that's not a, a place like we can say things like solidarity and unity, but if we all mean something different by blackness, there isn't a lot of solidarity. So that's more what I mean. It's like, what is a predicate? If, if we do, if under this domain of struggle, we, we have to conceive ourselves as political or as politically motivated, how do we find a common language where I can say blackness to you and you get what I mean and you can say blackness to me and I get what you mean? Because it seems to me that e that like we can have a plurality and plurality should be, you know, you know, accepted and affirmed. But if I can't communicate with you, then we can't get out of this mess that we call capital. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Professor Freeman. I'll go after you. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that. So first of all, I, I want to add to to um, what Dr. Elizabeth Horch Freeman was talking about in terms of um, <laughs> um, in 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 terms of not just languages, but a, a, not just a plurality in languages, but also a plurality in disciplines, right? So I think that's another part of it. But then um, we, I think it is it is helpful um, to have. I think it's helpful to have. I mean, first of all, it is helpful to have multiple languages, but it's also helpful to have common languages, like you were saying, so that we can have these discussions. But what that means is that we also have we have to we have to um, we have to develop the language that's there. Um, and it's and and that's where it's it's not something that's static. We can kind of question it. We can develop. We bring new terms to the table. Um, and 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 I think in discussions like this, one of the things that happens is that our concepts of blackness have to be unpacked. We can't just use the word blackness anymore. We have to actually say like, well, what do you mean by blackness? And this is what I mean. And then that may actually take on a term in itself, right? Um, but this is, but I think also uh, in, a, in a weird way, I don't even know if I can string this together, but I think this kind of goes back to, to this, 
to the idea of losing of okay of of um of sort of uh blackness disappearing i don't know if that was how we said it before but blackness disappearing um i think it is in i think it's in I think when we have the erasure of blackness, I mean, because I see that as the erasure of blackness. When we have the erasure of blackness, all of our contributions and um, of it are all, also go along with that. I think it's important to kind of keep those connections. I mean, I agree. the The point in which we we um, I, I I do want anti blackness to is to to be something that's abolished. But but blackness. Um, I think we have some ownership in that word. We're invested in that word. Maybe we don't use it always the same way, but our culture, our history, our ideas are built into it. And by abolishing that, we also, that's that's an erasure of of us, our culture, our history as well. Um, and that's kind of why, like when I say that 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 I, 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 I don't want a world without blackness, I do want a world without anti-blackness. Um. Here's my here's my follow up question, uh, Dr. Freeman. If the price to get to an anti black world is the elimination of blackness, would you if, if that were the price, would you be willing to pay it? Um, OK, I have, need more time to think about that, but I guess the question is, I guess my question would be like, well, what does that mean? Because um, even when we were talking about like um, blackness being dependent on whiteness or, but I think, I think whiteness is dependent on blackness. So for, I guess, both of those, both of those ideas would have to be sort of abolished, right? That's the first thing. Um, then is the next thing, is the next thing that we lose, that we become, well, what do we become? Do we become uh, just more complex altogether? Do we become white? Which I mean, which and I think if that's the case, then that is that does not sound like something that's appealing to me at all, because then that's about erasure. Um, but but I think um, it, in the same way that we say these things are are moving all, all, continuously, we're already there's already a um, dialogue and mixture between all of these categories. Like whiteness has become, I mean, the ideas about whack, whiteness have been structured from. From what it means to be black, too, they they adopt that as in the same way that we've adopted white ideas, which I, it's it will be weird to even call them white. There's a lot more mixture; they're not so static. Um, but if I, I think if it's if it's something where um, our contributions are still valued and live on, then yes, abol I mean, um, uh, to abolish whiteness and blackness sounds great to me. If there's a way to contain that, but then I don't know what the you know what what we grab on to 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 maintain those histories. Yeah, I, the the what to, that that is the thing that we can't know, right? Um, but I think Lewis Gorton puts it this way because because one of the things you're like, well, do we all become white? And that that is one great conception, like the colorblind uh, ideology, is that we will all assimilate to the point where white, right, whiteness is already the norm and we just become a part of that. Another way to think of it is everyone becomes black. Yeah. Uh, that's where the that's where the distinction uh, could get lost. Um, but since I've already articulated that, then, then we know that that's not the way out either. It has to be something else and whatever that thing is unsure. But Lewis Gorton uh, says that, sorry if you hear a car in the background, um, the first step right to, to getting through this problem of anti-blackness is that the rest of the world has to experience the blackened world it's not because we already experienced the white world we already experienced the brown world we already experienced the homophobic world we already experienced the misogynistic world the rest of the world needs to experience what it means to have a bleak existence that is not protected under the law that is not recognized as having political agency that has been dispersed through slavery that has been ripped apart and torn asunder in the name of democracy See, the rest of the world has to experience the loss in order for us to move forward. So it's not we who have to do the work, right? It's not us who need to be erased. It's this world. But once this world is erased, what, what residue is left from all of the work that we did to inaugurate the new one? That's an open question. And I think there's something beautiful in that. Dr. the mic is yours. <laughs> that that kind of reminds me of that saying that for in order um, 
in order for the phoenix to rise, it has to burn first, right? And kind of thinking through what that, what's the rise of the phoenix going to look like? We don't know that, but yeah, I love that. I love the way that you articulated that. I love it too. I don't have anything else to add except for earlier. I was going to say, I just had like, I guess an aha moment when um, Jordan was talking about the umbrella of the political definition of blackness being struggle or something. I forget exactly how you phrased it. And then I was like, oh, I guess that even for people who aren't willing to, I guess, buy into the idea or who can't identify with the struggle of being blackness based off of the color of their skin, there still is a struggle. And so I liked how you articulated that in terms of just kind of like this overarching idea of struggle, because I think that any time that if we continue to exist on this planet, there is going to be a struggle regardless of what form it looks like. I just hope that at some point it stops being a struggle based off of the color of our skin. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank y'all so much for attending our round table. Thank you to my brilliant fellows, Professors Freeman and Ponson. Y'all be on the lookout for our events that we'll be having in the spring. If you have an opportunity, please fill out our short survey. We have the link in the chat. And we look forward to seeing y'all in the new year.